Are you someone who challenges the potential of the possible because you want a new challenge professionally? Well, according to our friends over at Indeed, it seems if you answered yes to that very question, you're not alone. The publication reports that the average American will change the course of their career an average of five to seven times before they retire. For comparison's sake, our friends over at Zipria tell us that successful people will change their career path on average every three to five years to change the trajectory of a challenge that they're facing professionally across the United States. The site reports that the average American worker will change their professional outlook every 4.1 years. You can add my friend Jesse Simpson to that very list. He's a former U.S. Marine Corps veteran who traded in his dream job for a one-way ticket to Costa Rica. He felt trapped in his childhood dream job and wanted a switch. And now he's an entrepreneur, freedom fighter, and truth seeker. He now spends his time as the co-founder and chief freedom architect with abundant coaches, where he helps business owners fund their startups or scale their businesses without spending their own money. Simpson believes in unlocking abundance in all aspects of your personal and professional life, and he wants others to get their time back so that they can do more of the things they enjoy doing and impacting the world in the most positive manner they see fit. He joined me this week to have an in-depth discussion about his time in the service, helping others find their purpose and definition of abundant success, and so much more. This is a conversation if you're looking to establish more balance in every aspect of your life that you can't afford to miss. So without further delay, I'm Kevin McShann. Let's have this conversation. My friend, I'll take a moment to welcome you to the program, and I'm super excited to learn how to help businesses live a more abundant life, my friend. Great to see you today, and thank you so very much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited as well. Absolutely. So, Jesse, I'm going to start you off with a bit of a softball question and, and ask you, my, my friend, what do you think is the key to helping businesses unlock an abundant life in both their business operation and for the people who run it in their personal lives as well? A hundred percent. That's an excellent question. I, I will say that the business is the vehicle for abundance in the personal life. So that's the first thing to understand. But the best way I believe to unlock that abundance in the business is through a process known as credit stacking, where you can leverage multiple different 0% interest business credit cards. So if you get high limit, 0% interest business credit, you essentially have free money and a 12-day T-month runway to turn a vision into reality. And I, and I really believe that's the best way to get started on this process of starting up a business, acquiring assets without spending your own money. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Jesse, I know that you've spent some time in the U.S. Marine Corps, so I want to uh, thank you for your service, my friend. And I'm also curious to ask, to ask you, how did you time in the service really 
guide or influence what you're doing today? That's a great question, Kevin. I think the, the well, the way I listen, what comes up for me when I think about that question, Kevin, is my the driving force in my life since I was a young boy has been freedom. Fighting for freedom and serving my community is what I've done my entire professional life. And although I didn't think I'd be doing credit repair and business funding when I was a kid, now that I'm, I'm doing it, I, I realize that credit and finances specifically is the biggest block from freedom for most people in our current economy. So it's a perfect fit for what we're doing now, helping people unlock abundance to create more freedom in their life. So although they don't seem connected, they're highly connected and underlying foundational value that's driving me and has been my entire life is freedom. So I'm on a mission to help as many people become financially free as possible so they can unlock abundance and live a life of purpose and impact and do what they want to do with their friends and family. Yeah, and I, just, I know that uh, you also were a firefighter and you're saying that that was your dream job, my friend, but you also felt trapped in that dream job and you bought a one-way ticket to Costa Rica. So I'm wondering if you can tell me about the career pivot and why you, you, you thought it was so important to be so nimble when it, come, when it came to your uh, professional aspirations, my friend. Kevin, yeah, that's an excellent question. And yes, that's true. I, so ever since seventh grade, I wanted to be a Marine, a firefighter. Being a firefighter was my childhood dream job. And then when I got there and I was doing the job, I did it for over four years. I was actually recognized as the Arizona State Firefighter of the Year in, in 2017, uh, sort of like at the pinnacle of the profession. But then about a month later, I really hit this wall. And a lot of my childhood trauma, a lot of my military Marine Corps trauma was affecting me as, as well as the stressors of the job. And I just had this this calling inside of me to go experience more of life. And one of the things that really lit that fire with inside of me when I was transitioning from the Marine Corps in 2013, I went on a volunteer trip to Lima, Peru and worked at an orphanage. And th that trip totally changed my life. And I worked with these kids who had six and balls in dirt, but the biggest miles I'd ever seen. And it really had a, a profound impact, impact on how I, I perceived the world and, and my role in it. And when I was really struggling deeply and I was really questioning about everything about my life, I felt that tug back to South America. And that inevitably is what led to me selling all my things, uh, re resigning from my childhood dream job and taking that one way flight. It was a, a deep sense of pain and a knowing that there had to be more than life, more to life and, and just the willingness to go out and figure out what that meant and experience all that the world has to offer. Yeah, so Jesse, I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. Uh, and your message to people who may be afraid to take the leap of faith in life in terms of uh, following what their life ambition is and really what their calling in, is in life. So what would be your message to those people who are afraid to take the leap? That's a great question, Kevin. Well, I think the first thing to note is that I'm not necessarily recommending that every, everyone follow my path and take a one-way flight to Costa Rica and, and you know quit their job and take out their firefighter pension and, and X, Y, Z. I, we all have different paths. And uh, I believe, though, that we all have a, a purpose. We're all here for a definite purpose. And if someone feels they're not living their definite purpose, then it's their responsibility to find out what that is and lean all the way in. And what my experience has been in, in, in doing that for myself and risking everything in my life is even though I had no idea where I was going to land, each time I took a step, the next step would always appear. So what I've learned to, to do or to not do really is to surrender, to let go of control, to have faith that I'm being fully supported because over and over again, even when I feel like, um, even when I hit a block, and I'm really stuck and I'm struggling, as soon as I release, I am supported in the next step. And that's eventually what led me to Abundance Codes and my business now and my beautiful wife and our daughter. And so many beautiful things have happened. It's not easy, but 
from from my perspective, once someone gets clear on their purpose and what they where they want to go in their life, and they're willing to have the courage to take that first step, I believe, from my experience, that they will be supported each and every step along the way, getting to where they want to go. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Jesse, I want to take a minute to talk to you about the concept of overcoming adversity, and I'll give you a a personal example before I I'll let you answer the question. So, uh, Jesse. Uh, at the age of nine, my friend, I was actually told by a doctor that I would not uh, be able to walk uh, throughout the course of my life because of the uh, severity of my uh, cerebral palsy. It's something that I've dealt with uh, since birth. And when I graduated college, Jesse, because of my uh, disability, it took me uh, six years out of college to get my uh, first paying job because when I went into newsrooms, uh, news directors would look at me and tell me that I was a liability because of my uh, disability. But I overcame that by uh, working at, on a volunteer basis for four years, Jesse, without um, a paycheck at a, a local uh, television station. And through that, I got a chance to work with the government here in Canada to uh, positively promote the hiring of folks with disabilities. So uh, turning the question back to you, my friend, I know uh, throughout the course of your time in the service and throughout your own personal life, you've had to overcome adversity. So I, I'm curious, how do you define overcoming adversity effectively? That's an excellent question and a beautiful story, Kevin. Uh, first, when I just acknowledge you for always moving forward and not taking no for an answer, despite what you're experiencing. And um, yeah, look at you here now. So I really am grateful to be connected with you and to have this opportunity to to share this conversation. And I'm really proud of you for, for pushing through. So to answer your question, what well, what, what comes up for me with this is in, in before abundance codes, the the name of my coach, I, I, when I was struggling in the fire service, I was uh, having suicidal thoughts. I was very angry. I was depressed. I was in a really, really bad space. And I was really desperate. I was sick of living life, looking forward to retirement. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to, to push through 25 years, just like so, feeling this way. So that's what ultimately pushed me out. But I, what I realized in that moment, in that time period, is that action is the greatest adversary of adversity. So adversity can be defined by any number of things, by people's subjective experience. But my experience of whatever people define adversity as the best thing, the best antidote to that is taking action through it. There's a story about the buffalo. And the buffalo, when a storm comes, they, instead of running away from it like cows do, buffalo puts their head down in a pack and they move towards the storm. So they hit it, they they hit it directly. They move through it and it's over a lot faster instead of them running away like 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 the cows do. Well, it sounds like this has been your experience and very similar to mine, is when I realized I was stuck and I was in this position I didn't want to be in, I could sit there and I could feel sorry for myself. And I could sit there and wish that what was happening wasn't happening and and continue down that path in a victim mentality, or I can move forward through this and take action, take responsibility to move through it. And that has been the best gift for myself is the, having the courage to move through, take action to overcome that adversity. And so although I can't define what adversity means for every person, I do believe that the action that's required to overcome that is the best antidote for that adversity, whatever it might be. Yeah, and, um, you know, uh, talking about uh, uh, adversity and transition, Jesse, I'm curious, most people, when they get out of this service, they experience um, a period in their life of sort of, uh, sort of a loss of direction and purpose in their life. So I'm wondering, how did you connect the dots to the rest of your life once you got out of the service, my friend? That's another excellent question, Kevin. So 
One quote that comes up for me is by Steve Jobs. He says, you can't always connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. And that being said, when I got out of the Marines in 20, 2011, I just got back from combat in Afghanistan. As you could imagine, that's a very intense experience. I was a machine gunner, shot machine guns in combat. Uh, only a few months later, I was in community college classroom in Iowa. And I didn't have any awareness of my internal world, but I was uh, struggling quite a bit. Uh, just a lot of anxiety and just hypervigilance and um, just like under a constant state of alert. And I took some time to settle into uh, that new life. And I started to practice yoga, which really helped me calm my nervous system. But, and I, and I worked out and I got on some, uh, the rugby team and I did things like that to get involved and really just keep my already overactive mind and body engaged with things that were healthy at the time. That being said, I was still very lost. And I 100% agree that the, one of the biggest vacancies when people separate from the service is that clear and definite purpose along with the brotherhood and the mission and these sort of things. But for me, what really totally changed my life was that volunteer trip to Lima, Peru that I mentioned. So I, uh, I, I, I grew up, my mom owned a childcare. And so I grew up around kids. Like she had like 70 kids at once in, in her childcare, like a business. And I would go play with these kids as a kid myself, but a little bit older and go hang out with the three and four year olds and wrestle with them in the grass and throw the ball around and stuff like that. So I always had that like inner child within me that, that when I got out of the Marines, I, I felt called to reconnect with that. And that first thing for me was taking that volunteer trip to Lima, Peru. And when I went down to Peru, a combat Marine, I was just had this like sort of American privilege and I thought I was going to go help these kids. But after two weeks of playing with these kids who had sticks and balls and dirt to their name, but the biggest smiles I'd ever seen, it was clear that they changed me. They helped me realize a lot about what's important in life. It's the people. It's life here lived in the present moment, not the material possessions that we have and not the status that we hold, and the title and these sort of things or the money in our bank account necessarily. But it was more real and authentic. So for me, that set me on a journey to volunteering. And that was my way of reconnecting with service. So all throughout college, I volunteered at the Phoenix Children's Hospital in the oncology playroom. I was a, I was a mentor for, for a couple of uh, un underprivileged youth. And I did I worked at a grief camp for kids. I did all these different volunteer experiences, which ultimately culminated in me starting my own nonprofit where I was pairing up veterans who were transitioning with troubled youth. Because I had a mentor that that saved my life when I was a, a seventh grade boy, seventh and eighth grade boy, and I knew that I struggled as a as a Marine separating, and these kids were helping me, and I knew that a man or a, a military a, a service member who has been through some life experience, and they were leaving, and they could be paired up, and they could really create a strong connection that would support both of these populations that are so near and dear to my heart, and. What I started this nonprofit, and, and ultimately that's was my my purpose. It's why I was uh, I was living. I started that while I was a uh, firefighter, and that's part of what I, I was recognized as the firefighter of the year in Arizona in 2017. But ultimately, uh, a lot of things happened, and that year is a big year, a lot of highs and lows. And I, I skipped over this part earlier, but I eventually pulled the brakes on the nonprofit. I, I stopped working on the nonprofit, and that's really. Uh, uh, what set me into my deep depression where I was having suicidal thoughts. I had a total like loss of identity and who I was. Fire service wasn't working. My What I thought was my my purpose, connecting these people I cared so much about was no longer viable. I was completely burnt out trying to do both at the same time and struggling a lot in my family and my personal life. Um, so yeah, that's that's what it was for me. It's been this constant drive for, for finding purpose. And the last thing I'll say with this, Kevin, is I, I really believe that a lot of a lot of military men and women they go and they have this this call for service. We all go in for different reasons, but a lot of people have this desire to serve. They want to fight for freedom. That was my experience, at least. And and what I believe is the end of the contract in the military is not the end of service. It's the beginning. All of the time that you spend in the Marines or the military, wherever you might have served or not deployed to, whatever, has been building you up. So that you can step out of that container and show up and serve in a greater capacity 
Because one thing that's so missing in our society right now is write a, a rite of passage that helps men and women become from boys and girls to adult men and women that can really serve and lead in the community. So I, I, I really believe that um, it, it can be difficult and it's not the ending, the end, it's the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And taking parts of your life to answer, Jesse, I, I'm curious to ask you, what do you think it means to maximize and seize opportunities in life? And how can business owners really use that to scale their own businesses as well? Yeah, how can, how can business owners maximize opportunity in their life? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to do is like realize you got to go all in. You got to go all in. You can't sit around. You can't play half ass. You got to go all in on your vision, your goals. No one's gonna, no one's gonna come do it for you. And that's just a reality of the world we live in. And it's a great opportunity. So I think the first thing to do is to commit, commit to the vision, commit to the purpose, commit to the plan, whatever it is. Commit to going after something greater than yourself, serving some type of target population, whatever it is. Uh, and once that commitment is is made, I believe that clarity comes. And then whatever that looks like, it's hard to uh, it's hard to give a, a really well. I'm giving a really general perspective on this now, but so what I what I believe once you commit and you go all in, then you need to acquire funding. Realistically, you got to have you you got to have money to live in our world right now, and I believe the best way, the best opportunity right now, as far as funding goes, is is leveraging zero percent interest introductory offers on business credit cards. The reason I believe that is because I've spent. As I, I've started multiple businesses, as I said earlier, I've done a lot of traveling. And while I was traveling, I was starting my businesses. I hosted retreats in Colombia. I was doing all kinds of things that I feel really on purpose, but I was spending my own life savings, my own cash, my own personal credit cards. And I was racking up personal credit card debt. And that was negatively impacting my ability to really grow my business. And essentially, I was trying to pay for my everyday expenses with a business that wasn't yet, ma yet making money. And I was hurting my my personal credit and ability to take on new credit in the process. The opportunity to maximize within this space, what I, why I'm so passionate about what we do at Abundance Codes, is you can max out $100,000 in zero percentage credit on a business credit card on a business, and that won't even touch your personal credit score. So if someone's committed, they're ready to go all in, I think the best opportunity is to get a 12 to 18 month runway to go all in with this essentially free money and go all in on the vision without spending their own money by leveraging business credit. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jesse, if I gave you uh, a budget to create a 60 second commercial about abundance codes and how this mission has really changed your life, tell me, what would you uh, what would you focus the heart of the commercial on, my friend? What would I focus the heart of the commercial for abundance codes on? Yeah, what would you? Why is abundance codes uh, your passion and your purpose, my friend? What would the commercial be about? Yeah, I that's a great question. Thanks for that, Kevin. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we have an unbelievable opportunity right here in front of us where we can leverage the bank's money to build our vision for our future, for our family, a starter scale of business, acquire cash flowing real estate or other income generating assets, essentially alchemizing the bank, using the bank's money to build wealth for your family. That's the heart of what we're able to provide is a bridge and essentially, one of the things we've done is reduce all barriers to entry for anyone who wants to get into this. We offer full service credit repair. We do done for you business funding. There's literally nothing in the way other than a couple hundred dollars to get started just because it does require a, a bit of an energetic commitment. And from there, the done for you service until you can get 100K or more in zero percent interest funding. Yeah, and you know, uh, Jesse, based on your background and your expertise my friend i'm curious what does inclusion mean to you and the whole concept of allyship being in the service and your business life what does inclusion and allyship mean to you that's an excellent question yeah inclusion and inclusion and allyship mean to me really just seeing everyone as as equal and including everybody in that experience of life. And one of the things I, I really always reflect fondly of was my time in the Marines. 
And we were a hodgepodge group of people from all different backgrounds, all different colors, all different places in the country and world. And we came together with a definite purpose, a clear system that we're working on. And we move through all kinds of adversity because we weren't focused on external factors that defined us, but by what we were willing to commit to and how we were willing to show up and serve despite the overwhelming adversity that we were facing. So to me, this is all about looking beyond those external things and really getting to know people at a deep level to understand what really drives them, who they are as an individual, and ultimately seeing that we are all humans and we're all on this on this earth for a reason. And we all have so much more similar than we are different. And once we can look beyond superficial differences, we can really step up into becoming more united, connected, uh, inclusive world for all, all of us to be a part of supporting each other, becoming the best version of ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Jesse, I'm also curious to ask you about pushing beyond the boundaries of our own limitations in both life and in business. How do you think we eliminate distractions to reach prosperity? How do we push boundaries in our life and business to reach prosperity? Yes, sir. That's an excellent question. And I think it's it's a really rich question. I think what came up to me was it's a, it's an inside game, ultimately, and something I'm learning to do. And in my my belief is that our internal world, or excuse me, our external world is a direct reflection of our internal world and our state. So this idea of, of, of freedom, of abundance, of even prosperity, I think that we can create these things on uh, inside of us even before they match our external reality. And in doing so, we will create that reality for ourselves. And to me, what this means is having faith that that will work because some people need proof. Well, this is where surrender, this is where faith, this is where trust, this is where like putting the work in and and, and waiting for things to manifest in, in external world is, is necessary. But ultimately, that's that's what I think. I think we have to create this, this the state of what we desire inside of us first, coming into greater, deeper connection with ourselves, with our loved ones, with what we really want in our life, and just be willing to move forward without any sense of uh, quit inside, with a clear commitment on our goals, our aspirations, and our vision. Yeah, and uh, you know, just uh, switching back, back to your business background for a second. I, I'm curious to ask you, why do you think the average person should care about their finances, even if they're not in business? So why do you think we should make fitness of, of finances rather a, a priority for our success? Well, I can't speak for everyone, but I value freedom. And right now, the mechanism, the way to create freedom, uh, other than internal freedom, which is very important because there's people that have plenty of money and they are totally trapped in their life or their business or their internal state is all out of whack. So it can go either way. But I believe once that internal state is, is aligned, it's feeling good, the external reality that needs to shift is the financial world. Uh, Freedom is a driving force in my life. And in order to have freedom to spend time with my beautiful daughter and my wife and to travel and to have amazing conversations like I'm having with you right now, Kevin, and to continue to live my purpose, I have to have the ability to provide for my family and have quote unquote financial freedom that allow me to do what I want with what I want with my life. And so I think that's that's really key in navigating this world successfully is to Master the internal freedom game. Secondary to that is is really create financial freedom so you can truly live uh, free. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Jesse, tell me why was the birth of your daughter a uh, sort of turning point in your life? That's a great question too. Well, my the birth of my I heard a, a quote around the time my daughter was born. And when I left the fire service, it was it was very challenging. 
I was inspired. I had to leave. You know, I had a great traveling experience. It was incredible. I met all kinds of amazing people. And I, I was very confused. Confused it's about who who I am like what what am I doing now my childhood dream job is all right that's not it so what comes next and I struggled for purpose I didn't know what I was doing and I, I found little hints of it along the way but nothing that really stuck and a quote that I heard not long after my daughter was born was instead of wondering what your purpose is ask what does God want from you so essentially flipping the, conver- the the question on its head instead of it's like, what do I want? What does the world need from me? And it pulled me out of myself and it helped me realize that what the world needs is, is freedom. And what the world needs is an opportunity to spend more time with their family. So what my daughter provided along with this question, which was right on time when she was born, was an opportunity to step outside of myself and step into a, a higher level of, of leadership and direction and service so that I can really provide for my daughter. And on top of that, my I, I'm hyper aware that my daughter is going to marry someone that's just like me. So it's my responsibility to break cycles of scarcity in my family tree. It's my responsibility to break the negative patterns, the negativity, the uh limitations that have been passed down through my family it's my responsibility to break them and now that my daughter's here it's very clear that if i don't i will be consciously passing those on to her and at this point in my life i will not tolerate that to the best of my ability and i'm going to continue serving in her honor and and moving forward with that and the third thing i'll say kevin is my baby girl, she, she spins her head around and she smiles at me every time I walk into the room. She follows me around when I'm walking in the room. She's, she wants to know what I'm doing at all times. And it's just the sweetest, most special thing that I, that I could have ever imagined. So another driving force is to be able to experience more of that. Yeah. Being a, a dad is the, uh, the most important job you'll ever have, right? I think so. That's right. Uh, absolutely. Can you tell me, what do you think it means to live your life from a position of strength? From strength? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. What do I think it means to live my life from a position of strength? I think this is all this is all relative, but but my belief is that the world, the universe, the creator, whatever it is that orchestrates a lot of these things. Uh, is always pushing us to our fullest capacity. And whether we like it or not, whether we resist it or not, we're going to be pulled through or pushed through, depending on how we want to move through the challenges that we're going to face. So I think living with strength is the willingness to meet that, meet those challenges, meet the diversity, whatever it is, with courage on our feet, standing up in the face of it, instead of passively trying to navigate it or avoiding it or using substances to cope to escape from it. So strength is leaning in instead of running away. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, just as you brought up the fact that you uh, like to travel and you get abundance from traveling, my friends, I'm wondering whether it was your time in Costa Rica or for your other travels throughout uh, the world, either domestically or internationally, my friend, what are some of your favorite mem- memories from traveling? That's a beautiful question. Wow. Well, so I spent about eight months in Central and South America, then eight weeks backpacking through Europe, and then about six, eight months traveling throughout the United States. So many things happened. I always like to share. I got, well, the one thing, yeah, I'm kind of getting flooded right now with a lot of them. They're all coming to me at once right now. But a couple of things I'll share. So it was in January of 2013 when I took that that trip to Lima, Peru, and worked, worked in an orphanage. And that that feeling, that experience that I had there is really what pulled me out and, and set me on to South America when I was struggling. And it was really special because then in, in January of 2019, six years to the date, I was back in Lima, Peru, 
And I remember sitting out on this beautiful sun, this beautiful sunset, looking out of the Pacific Ocean in Lima, and the sky was incredibly bright pink and orange. And it was just like the universe, like acknowledging me for having the courage to go out. So it was this big, huge six year cycle that was came to a T there in Lima. And I, I really, um, yeah, that was one that was really special. Another one that really was big was Colombia, Colombia, just the whole country. I lived there for two months. It's such an incredibly beautiful country. So misunderstood. I've talked to dozens of people and almost every single time someone asks, uh, someone, I almost every single time someone hears me say I live in Colombia, like their first thought is either Narcos, Netflix, or kidnapping. And I think it's a real disservice to the beauty of the country because the countryside is incredibly rich. It's beautiful with mountains, jungles, waterfalls. The city of Medellin, Colombia, where we were at, was the most dangerous city in the world. It transformed into the most innovative city in the world. And it has a really bustling, lively, beautiful culture, uh, tech hub. It's really cheap, which is amazing. But on top of that, the icing on the cake is the people there. The most warming, welcoming people I've ever met, literally walking across the street to say, welcome to Colombia. My home is your home. Thank you for coming. And that was my experience uh, on one walking tour. The first, uh, the third day we were there, five people came up and said that to us. Thank you for coming. My home is your home. Welcome to Colombia. And that was our experience the rest of the two months. Over and over again, we were welcomed. We were thanked. We just felt this overwhelming sense of connection. And for me, one time sitting in this small town, looking over this beautiful lake called in this town called Guatape, call it the most colorful town in Colombia. And all these houses are painted different colors. And it's on this beautiful lakeside property. And I remember sitting out looking and I was like, I want to help other people experience this. And I didn't know what that meant, but two years later, I was hosting retreats in Colombia, taking people back to that exact same mountaintop where I was at thinking that. So those sort of experiences are really special to have been so deeply touched by these beautiful countries and the people that were there. And then on top of that, be able to bring people from all over the world to that same exact spot was really special. And uh, yeah, just a lot of like deep connections. My wife, we ended up getting engaged in front of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, which was really special. Um, and Colombia was really what set it in. How she evolved throughout our time there was really special to witness. And there's just so many little moments, but those are some of the big ones. Yeah, and, and you know, I guess I just uh, uh, talking to you this afternoon, I know that you are someone with a grateful heart of experiences and you live your life from a position of gratitude, my friend. So I'm curious, what does it mean to uh, you to live your life from a position of wealth? Because there are uh, different ways that you can make a di difference and live your life with abundance. But what do you think it means to live your life with wealth? while also making a difference and an impact in life. Yeah, what does it mean to live life with wealth and make an impact? Well, I think I think the thing with this is, well, you started to say gratitude in there a little bit, and that really is sticking with me right now. I think, and really for where I'm at right now with my life and my personal relationships, living from a place of, of wealth monetarily is, I believe, something that's important. I do believe that if I have wealth and I have a, an abundance of, of prop or um, assets and, and, and money, that I can make a bigger impact. But really, right now, what I'm thinking of in terms of wealth is relationships, of gratitude, of energy, of vitality, of connection. And one thing that I'm really working on personally right now is, is deepening in connections with important relationships so that I can continue to move forward and keep a really close connection with what's actually important. Because no matter what kind of numbers in the bank account when I die, I don't get to take that with me. And I won't be thinking about how much money I made or whatever. What I will be thinking about is the people I've connected with 
and how I shared appreciation and love. And, and I let them know that I value them. And, and I believe along with that, there's a real opportunity to bring that energy, create impact and do it while making money because of the value and service that's being provided to people at scale. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jesse, I've got a, a two-part question for you because, you know, uh, one of the reasons, Jesse, I wanted to start this podcast three and a half years ago was I looked at the world and I said there had to be more that brings us together ra rather than sort of creates division. So my two-part question is this, Jesse, what do you think it'll take to sort of Heal the divisions of the divine in society today. And what brings you the most hope in life, my friend? Yeah, what will it take to heal the divisions? And what gives me hope? Well, I think what it will take to heal the divisions will be whatever it is it takes for us all to realize that we are far more similar than we are different and that the, the the visions that are being forced in our face are artificial and they're made up by people in positions of power that are using them to control us and manipulate us and turn us against each other instead of turning outbound and looking at those those people that are doing this so i think that um well, I don't know exactly what it'll take. I I do feel a sense of concern around that specific question about what it could take because of what's happening now and what continues to happen and how it seems like humanity, we haven't quite learned the lesson yet. But regardless, what gives me hope? Well, one of the things that gives me hope is i was at this retreat about a month ago now i was at a, it was ayahuasca retreat which is a psychedelic plant medicine from the amazon jungle and the leader of the kutanawa tribe was brought his medicine from the jungle of brazil up here to sedona arizona to share the medicine and i've done ayahuasca a few times and a lot of times it's a very inward journey. But the second night with the Kutanawa was a very community-based journey. And we were under the full moon in Sedona, Arizona. We were singing songs about peace around the fire. And I realized in that experience that regardless of what's happening right now in the world, there is a, a new humanity that's being born. And I believe we are it. You and I. And so I think what really gives me hope is that experience, because it really opened me up to seeing that in that circle, singing songs about peace. But ultimately, what gives me hope is that I see people like you in me, taking responsibility and owning our purpose and stepping up to serve in some capacity, meeting the world with strength, moving into the adversity that we're experiencing. And it's everyday people like you and I willing to do that over and over and over again that will create that new version, the best version of ourselves that we need to move past all these artificial divisions. Yeah, absolutely. And my final question uh, today, Jesse, has to do with the whole notion of responsibility and legacy. Because, you know, Jesse, I firmly believe that we're all given a life compass in life, and it's incumbent upon all of us to sort of point it in the direction that we want it to go. So as I ask you my final question about your own personal and professional legacy and how you want that to be defined. I'm, I'm curious, uh, how do you view that question under the, the lens of responsibility of moving the needle of progress 
forward for you yourself personally, my friend. How, what are your thoughts then? That's a great question. Well, this is two pronged for me. Again, there's a monetary component because at the end of the day, when I pass on, I want to leave something behind for my daughter so that in, in my future kids, so that they have something that they can build their life from. I really believe, I feel a strong sense of calling a responsibility to sever connection to scarcity in my family tree and grow in abundance so that my children and their children will have freedom. Along with that, what I want to be remembered for is not the financial stuff that the fake money, the currency, the credit cards or whatever, you know, that I have that I can leave for my, for my children. It's really about how I'm remembered, which is I want to be remembered for being open, open hearted and, and very loving and very generous and, and very grateful and appreciative. And Kevin, and I have been thinking about this a lot lately. You're actually the third person who's asked me this in the last two weeks. And I have realized that I'm not that person. I'm not open hearted. I am not always loving. I am not sharing appreciation where I can. And I feel deeply saddened by that. And I'm going to choose to take responsibility for that and move forward with strength. Because I know that I am responsible for, for living that if that's the way I want to pass on. And I'm going to continue doing my best to share appreciation, stay open hearted, and really just be grateful for all the people around me. Because I think that is what is the key to living a, a rich and meaningful life. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, finally, Jesse, tell me if people want to get uh, connected with the great work that you do with Abundance Coach or yourself personally, my friend. What's the best way they can do that? Yeah, Kevin, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, everyone, for listening. The best way to get a hold of me is on Instagram, action underscore Jesse, J-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. Shoot me a message. Let me know if this, this podcast resonated with you, if you have any questions. I love connecting with people. One of my favorite things to do while traveling around the world was then to meet other people that I travel with in different places. I kind of see this as the same, like my virtual like friends and family, people who listen to a podcast and we connect on Instagram and who knows where it could go. So I always welcome people and invite people to, to reach out on Instagram. Otherwise, abundancecodes.org is our website. We have a, a lot of free giveaways on there. We have, we have a free masterclass. We have a free ebook. We have a free credit strategy call for anyone who's interested in learning more about what I do. But we'd love to just send out the invitation to reach out on Instagram, action underscore Jesse. Fabulous, Jesse. I really want to thank you for the good work that you do to move the needle of progress forward and providing business owners with the financial freedom and clarity they deserve to live a more abundant life, my friend. Again, I want to thank you uh, for your time and the service and for joining me to engage in conversation this afternoon. It's most appreciated. Kevin, thank you so much. It's been a real honor to be here with you. You asked excellent questions. It's one of my favorite shows to be on. So thanks so much for having me.